just black people, but like Irish people, Polish people, they'll say, oh, you know, like they, they like say, oh, I'm Irish, I'm Italian, but you don't very often ever hear somebody say, I'm Jewish. Like they don't blow their horn about their... Oh, they usually don't. Their hair There's a real reason. I've never There's heard a real reason that. why they don't. They persecute. They are. They are. They are actually in the United States. They are the most persecuted group. The most group that has the most prejudice against. In the United people. States. In the United States. Well, you yeah. don't hear about it. like say the the black people talk about it all the time, but you don't hear people the Jewish people saying how they're so persecuted. They have never talked about it. Black people can't hide it. Jewish people can. Well, the Muslims talk about it. Now that's their big thing is that they're being persecuted. How come the Jewish people don't talk about it? Because they're not fighting their battle. What do you mean? The black people thought they needed to do that because nobody else would speak up for them. The Muslim people who aren't getting persecuted like they say they are think they needed to speak up because nobody would stick up for them. But the Jewish people know that there is somebody who will stick up for them. Who? Oh. God. But I thought you said they were turning away from God, so why would they believe oh, that? Oh, come on. <laughs> it's a contradictory what you're saying. No, that, it's not. That they're turning away from God. It's them. not. It's, uh, it's something they know, but they just don't want to admit it and turn towards them? Well, some of them admit it, but how much towards them they turn, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. But even though they may not turn to him. Um, like I love all my kids with all my heart. They might end up doing stuff and end up being in prison. They're still going to own all my love. Am I going to be happy with their actions? I am not. But am I going to disown them as family? No, never. Oh, so they always know they're their chosen people. Yes. You know, and when you, you go to Israel and you <laughs> talk to some of them people over there, they'll say, Jesus, he, he wasn't the Messiah. <laughs> he was a good guy. Yeah, a real good church. guy. That's what they said. Yeah. He was a real good guy. Yeah, but they don't say he was the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, if they do their Messianic Jews yeah. three times, yeah. totally so if they do their Messianic Jews. I never knew that. So they're still the most persecuted people in the United States? They're actually the most persecuted people in all the world. Yeah, that's that's right. right, I remember you said that, but I was just, yep. I guess I was just thinking so they, about but the But they United are States. definitely the most persecuted people in the United States. Wow. I was watching the news tonight, and it was Fox News, and they showed a Jewish young man, probably in his mid-20s, something like that, walking down the streets in Paris, and somebody had video on him, and you could hear the people taunting this yes. man because taunting he was him. Jewish. Yes. There was, some mm -hmm. guy spit on him, yeah. and they were, mm -hmm. and this was just this week, today, yes, or whatever. Was just this week, that's right. And the guy was doing nothing but walking down the street. Right. And now ISIS has 150 uh, Christians that they're uh, they're planning on even worse than what they've done in the past. I can't imagine what that's going to be. So from that time on, Israel was divided. There, there was no unity in Israel. We'd like to think that after they got back into that land, which takes place during Ezra and Nehemiah, that there was unity. And that's a nice thought. <laughs> Hear me carefully. It's a nice thought. One of the interesting things about that is they go back and they build a temple, and their main guy that was giving them the most problems, his name is Tobiah. You can read this for yourself in the book. He did everything in his power to keep them from putting up that temple, but as soon as they got it up, guess who went to the king to make sure he had a room right in that temple? Mm -hmm. Tobiah. Mm -hmm. He didn't go there to be supportive. He didn't go there to be supportive. And one of the guys says, you really want to get God in here? You're going to have to grab that Tobiah, tie him up, and throw him out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the scripture says. Understand? And, uh, and so we're here. They were divided. Even during the time of Christ, his first advent, his first time that he was here in the flesh, Christ has always existed. That's the mystery of God that's hard for us to grasp in its entirety, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, too. That's also hard for us to grasp in its entirety, but that is, and he has always existed. But this part of the Godhead became flesh to all among us, so we could touch him, feel him, so he could understand. This, the main portion of that is so when we stand in judgment, somebody could say, 
you don't know what it's like to be human. Yeah. I had a kid on my bus saying, you don't know what it was like to be 15. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, four, four no, <laughs> I think he told that to the wrong person. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I said, you mean because this, 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 and this, and his eyes got about this big around. <laughs> and he said, how old are you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you could stand in judgment and say, God, you don't know what it's like. And there's a Messiah that's going to stand up, and you're going to eat those words right at that moment because... He knows what it's all like, every little thing. When Jesus comes on the scene, there is not unity. There is still not unity. Remember, he goes to Samaria. The Samaritan <laughs> woman says, our forefathers say we should worship here. Your forefathers say we should worship there. There were people from up north that were coming down to the temple, but there were still a whole lot of people that were worshiping in Samaria. Did they have unity of purpose of worship? Well, I don't know. No. They did not have unity of purpose of worship. Now, there was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, mm -hmm. and several other groups. What do we have? Political powers. Are they unified? They probably are. No, they no, weren't. They weren't? Not at all. Huh. Kind of like ours? Kind of like <laughs> ours. Very much like ours. If you look Paul understood that, and, you can, and I'll show you this from the scripture, at the end of the book of Acts, when Paul preaches his last time in Jerusalem, and a riot breaks out, it looks like they're going to pull him apart, and the Roman guard hears the riot, they come in and rescue Paul. <laughs> and Paul realizes these guys are still all in their political groups. And so he immediately made an appeal. He says, I'm being harassed because... I have proclaimed about a resurrection of the dead. And so then the Pharisees, who believed in the resurrection of the dead, who had been part of those that were trying to pull him apart, all of a sudden said, whoa, we can't let the, the Sadducees have an upper hand on this. And so he used their own political poise against them to give himself oh, some boy. peace to be able to talk. Mm -hmm. There's still today a couple of houses in Israel. We had a great speaker. Robin got this on YouTube. I got to see it. Oh, he did? Yes. Wasn't that fantastic? Yep. I'm going to tell you, though, how he missed some things. Okay. Well, it was only 15 minutes. Uh, what? But he missed some important things. He said that America should definitely be supporting Israel because it's a democratic nation. Mm -hmm. Now, let I me ask, he, I, I let me ask you this. He, he did say that. Yeah. It's not right. Oh, really? It's not right. Should they be a democratic nation or not? Who, Israel? Israel. If there's a democratic nation, there's always going to be two what? Uh, two parties. If there's a democratic nation, there's always going to be two parties. We've already looked at some of the scriptures where it says God has to bring them into a unity. Because they're going to look for a king. And you can't look for a king with two parties. It's not the democracy that's important. It's the fact that they are the spiritual roots. That's what's important. How many understands that? Uh, an object lesson in prophecy, Ezekiel 37. Most of you should know what Ezekiel 37 is about. Dry bones. Dry bones. Very good, Ben. <laughs> You're going to sing for us? The, the song that goes yeah. like that? <laughs> I never can get the words all right, but it sure is a fun song. You know, the knee bone connected to the oh, ankle bone, the ankle bone connected to the toe bone, the toe bone connected to the... That's how the bones go around. Amen. Oh, Ezekiel 37, 15 through 23, and I'm going to let somebody else read it because my voice is going downhill rather than uphill. If your Bible's the same as mine, it's on page 605. <laughs> 37, 15 to 23? 15 to 23. Ah, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, Ephraim's stick, belonging to Joseph and all the house of Israel associated with him. <coughs> Join, bless you. Join them together into one <coughs> stick, yeah. bless you again, so that they will become one in your hand. When your countrymen ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm going to take the stick of Joseph which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, 
Join it to Judah's stick, making them a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on, and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. Now, I want you to see how powerful this is. One of our own Assemblies of God guys, back before the 40s, had written a theology book. And uh, Dave Twist, who's our presbyter now, he was doing home study courses to get his credentials. And he calls me up. He says, Rick, he says, have you ever read Meyer Perlman? I says, of course. I said, it's the main textbook. He says, well, what, is the guy off the wall or something? He'd read about that whole passage. And Meyer Perlman, Perlman referred to the Israel going back into the land as being figurative. In fact, a lot of Christianity thought that was figurative. But now we know it's not figurative, it's literal. If that's literal, what's the chances of the next few things being literal? Good. We should expect them to be literal. How many understands that? What is it saying? It says the two kingdoms will be joined into one kingdom. You can get on the internet and still read about the two houses of Israel. It's still prevalent today, and they see it right as their political parties today, and there's obstacles that go back and forth. I'm going to share one of those obstacles with you at the present time about something that's happened right as we speak. If I'm going to be really Jewish, and I'm going to really mean it, I'm going to keep to what? If I'm going to be really Jewish, and I'm going to really mean it, I'm going to keep to what? All of the rules. All of the rules. One of the rules is every so many years I have to do what with my land? Yeah, not use it. We have a few answers and they're all right. <laughs> One of them is every seventh year I needed to let that land lay. Now if you were intelligent, Obviously, you wouldn't start working all your fields the same year because if you did on the seventh year, you wouldn't be doing anything to any of the fields. If you bought land off of somebody in the 50th year, it was called the year of Jubilee and it was supposed to be given back. Given back. Now, that doesn't mean 50 years from the time that they bought it. Every 50 years was a year of Jubilee. So next year might be the Jubilee, and I'm in a financial bind, so I'm going to sell care of my property because I know next year she'll have to give it back. <laughs> she's not going to give you much for it if she knows she's only going to. She probably isn't going to give me right. so much for it. Understand? But either way, it's going to return to me. I might have to turn around and sell it again and wait 50 years before I can get it back again, but it keeps returning. I want you to understand that. This is what had happened way back in the book of Ruth. Ruth comes back into the land and because of the time slot, she's able to reclaim the land that was her husband's. And uh, then, of course, it has to be redeemed. It has to, you know, and that redemption is what Boaz does for Ruth in the process of that land. Does that make sense to you now? <coughs> redemption, is it money? Is that what they... Yeah. Okay. This, uh, what's taking place right now as we speak in the land of Israel, because I'm going to show you physical things that have spiritual bearings. A whole lot of those that are realizing we need to follow the law, and that's not all of Israel. They have two houses. One house that says, God hasn't helped us out. Yeah, maybe we got back in the land, but that was because of England and the United States. You know, it wasn't because of England and the United States. How many knows that? We might have signed the papers, but the papers were really signed by God. Okay? But they have the two houses, the two trains of thoughts. And so the ones that are following the scriptures, wanting to follow the scriptures, made a petition to the government that they would like to let so much of their land be dormant this seventh year, and following those particular things, and to do that, there needed to be money set aside to, in case they need to buy stuff. And so a bill came into the Israeli Congress to set aside $30 million for this particular 
fallow project. That's the words mm -hmm. in the English. Mm -hmm. I can't say the words in Hebrew. Sorry about that. <laughs> but that's what it's called. It's called the fallow project, meaning they're going to let the ground be fallow for a year. Of course, they got back there and they started putting a lot of that ground all at the same time, so it's a big section of ground that's going to be fallow for this year. And, of course, there was an awful battle in Congress. But guess how the vote went? They put aside $30 million. If you look at CUFI, which is Christians United for Israel, they have almost matched that $30 million so that there won't, so that there won't be a problem with them following the law of God, leaving that be fallow for that period of a year. What year is that going to be that they're going to do that? Right now. Oh, this year? Yeah. Now, they're not going by our calendar. Oh, okay. Got to remember that. Yeah. They're not going by our calendar. Yeah. They're going by the Jewish calendar, yeah. which in us is still a calendar from B.C. Mm. Okay? Yeah. And uh, this, is, this is that year where they're supposed to have that fallow ground. And so for that to come to Congress, what's the spiritual climate beginning to do in Israel? Change. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. How many thinks that's cool? Spiritual climate is beginning to change. They're going to begin to practice some of these things more and more and more. As they begin to practice these things, it's going to bring the thing that Jeroboam was afraid of, the nation being united under that one God again. God has always meant for them to be united under that one God. And Netanyahu just was on TV saying, calling all Jews home to Israel. Because they were saying they're getting persecuted in Belgium and different places. He says, come home. He says, come home. Come home. That's what he was saying. Come home. And that's scriptural. He says, don't fight it there. Come on home. Yeah. And that's scriptural, yes. Yeah. And people say, well, that's so many people. How can the land hold them? Well, I thought that when I was a kid. How can the land produce for them? But it does. That's it true. does. That's well, it can't be any worse than Japan or some of those places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got bombs coming in every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, will all the Americans go over there too when, when he's calling them home? Will the Americans? I don't know how many will go. I have, I happen to know that uh, in the eastern part of the United States, it, and I'm going to share this with you, here in the eastern part of the United States, if all of the Jewish people go home, we're going to lose over two-thirds of our doctors. Mm -hmm. We're going to um, lose our best heart doctors. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we'll print for you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> she says the heart doctor is done. <laughs> so how many will go? I don't know. I don't know. I, is God calling all of them back? I don't know that either. I know that my that my messianic brother, yeah. that's the rabbi, he believes that God will call all of them back. And uh, his son, who is also a messianic rabbi, was in, so I was able to converse with the both of them, and this was very interesting, because one's older, he's 80-something, and then the one's only about 50-something, and uh, the one that's 50-something said, Dad, you got that wrong. <laughs> And of course, Dad doesn't think he's wrong. Dad thinks he's going to call all, even the Messianic ones back. And he said, we've been liberated from the law under Christ Jesus. He said, he may not call us back. He may want us to stand with the Christians. And I thought, and maybe he wants the Christians to stand with the Messianic Jews. Exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, that was my thought immediately yeah. when he said that. And so he began to understand as far as the other ones, that seems to be a pretty powerful call from Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. Just to let you know that, that well, seemed to be a pretty powerful call. The other question I have is that, um, you know how everybody intermarried anybody today, they don't care? Do the Jews, Jewish people do that? Not if they much. do, they're looked down upon. Unless the one that marries in becomes Jewish. Jewish. And if they become Jewish, that's the same as Rahab, the heart that became Jewish, then they're not looked down upon. Mm -hmm. but, but does uh, it happen very often? I mean... People becoming Jewish? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know if that happened. That happens uh, 
because they're young men or they're young ladies, fine guys or gals that aren't of the Jewish faith that they like and, and to get married. And sometimes they do that after they get married. They go through a whole series of classes. The rabbi from Baha'i Brith, he, uh, he makes, uh, when a couple marries like that and, and one shows an interest in becoming uh, a real Israelite, a real Jew, he has both partners come back to go through all those classes because he figured the one must not have done too good or they wouldn't have made this choice to start with. <laughs> That's his own words, I don't realize. And that doesn't mean that he's slighting that person. He's not because they made that decision to become of the Jewish faith. And so he takes them both back to what they should have already known and been practicing and stuff like that. And so the call from Netanyahu is definitely powerful. This is going on as we speak. They've got groundless laying fallow. Just as simple as that. One of the things that you're going to see, and I think that we'll see this before too long, is you're going to see the return of sacrifice. The morning and the evening sacrifice. I really believe that that's coming. I really believe that that's coming. Yeah. Like who is going to sacrifice? The priests are going to perform the sacrifices. In Israel. In Israel. In the land, in Jerusalem. Stuff, but do Birds. they consider themselves? Oh. You don't mean people. No. Animals. No. Animals. Lambs, and lambs, birds, lambs, birds, doves, That's what she means. She means she thinks you mean people. That, I, That's what 20 I years ago, <laughs> 20 years ago, Eric Place, Linda Place's husband, he already knew this 20 years ago. One of the prophecies is about the sacrifice of a red heifer. Mm -hmm. A red heifer doesn't come naturally in any cows. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so he had followed this very carefully. Twenty years ago they had finally bred enough that they actually have red heifers. And they have mm -hmm. kept a line of red heifers. And the purpose for those red heifers is for that sacrifice. That's mm -hmm. what the red heifer is for. And it wasn't something that comes easy meaning that your following of God doesn't come easy. Jesus even said it wouldn't come easy. Understand? Mm -hmm. Following of God is a challenge. Let's get harder and harder. Let's get harder and harder. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to find your face with understanding. I know. She thought he meant people. He goes, ooh. That's the best thing ever. The, the ones that follow Christ consider themselves messianic. But do they call themselves Messianic Jews? A lot of them call themselves Messianic Jews. A lot, of, a lot of them call them, they have a lot of different names for them. Uh, I have realized from my Jewish friends that there are names that I will use that I, that I won't use because it's offensive to Jewish people that haven't found Christ. Right. Like some Jews call themselves completed Jews. If I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. I feel that I'm already completed because God's my father. And I'm not going to say you haven't become a completed Jew because you haven't followed Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That would be like, mm -hmm. you know, throwing my boot into the stew that we're making. <laughs> I figured you'd like that, Kevin. Just because it's food? Is that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, terrible. Be. Look on your face was speechless. <laughs> 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 I don't. <laughs> I didn't reminded think me of, that reminded me of a song. Persons. No, not a person. <laughs> but I think I really believe that those sacrifices will be coming. If you look there, he's calling them back to the land, and they're going to want one king. They're going to be united for what they want. We haven't seen this yet, but we are seeing this closer now because of the opposition that they're getting, regardless of one state or the other. They are all beginning to want to say, hey, we're tired of the bombs. Let's take them out. Right. That cry is coming from both parties. So what is that cry doing? Uniting. It's uniting them. It might not be the right cry, but it's definitely uniting them. What do we pray? Remember, this is about how we pray. We need to pray for the spiritual uniting of Israel. Just like when 9-11 in the United States became united for a while. For a little while. Yeah. For a little while. Very little. <laughs> <laughs> so we pray for, that's what we pray for, understand? When you're praying for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying for them to get in touch with God. You're praying for the reuniting of them in Ephraim to be united with Judah. 
This is, if you read this in the Greek, this is really interesting. The prophet takes two sticks and he writes the name of Israel on one and the name of Judah on the other. Or Ephraim on one and Judah on the other. I forget exactly how it was. And then he's to bind them together so much so that they become one in his hand. It's called lashing. That's what we do. And it's called lashing. And uh, lashing is so, so interesting. If you do it right, it's actually stronger than the branch was to start with. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like wood glue. You've mm -hmm. seen this with wood glue. Yeah. Here you got a piece of wood, and here you got a piece of wood. Great. You glue them together. So you can hit them with a hammer, and they're going to break any place except for that glue seat. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's literally what that bonding was showing. And, of course, it was calling attention to everybody. They wanted to know what it was about. I was asked this by a teenager. Well, how did they see this? Let me explain the sticks. The sticks were his walking stick. How would they have seen the stick? Every place he went, what would have been with him? His cane. His cane. <laughs> Very good, Carol. His walking stick. <laughs> Only it would have been the two of them so firmly together that it was like one stick, but it would still have been apparent that it was a two. But isn't it called grafting? Well, that, graft, that's not called grafting. grafting in. Yeah, it calls for cutting for grafting. This wasn't any cutting. This was just bound together. And they become what? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And so you pray for their oneness. Their oneness in purpose. Their oneness in seeking the face of God. Is there going to be opposition? Yes. Do you pray against that opposition? Definitely. That's only appropriate. But you, what should you be expecting? That the opposition is going to leave or that there's going to be spiritual transformation? You should be expecting spiritual transformation. When that happens, opposition leaves. Does that make it clear? When that happens, the opposition leaves. You saw that all the way through the Old Testament. Gideon rises up and the opposition left. All the while Gideon was alive. Samson rises up. He messed up really good. But there wasn't any opposition when Samson was done because 30,000 of them all died when he died. Understand? Mm -hmm. And you look at the judges in those situations. You look at the different kings that followed God. The ones that followed God, they had, these things went well for them. Did it mean that they didn't have some troubles? They had some troubles, but they weren't getting taken away captive or things like that. Yes. Understand? And so you pray for that spiritual climate. You pray for that oneness in Israel. They will end up not being a democracy. I believe that with all of my heart. They're going to look for a leader. They're going to look for a leader. A king. A king. A king. Has there been any work on the new temple? Uh, the new temple, uh, just to share this, and I've known this for a long time. The new temple, just like Solomon's temple, there was not supposed to be the sound of any tool on the spot. The new temple is all ready so that they can be assembled without the sound of any tool on the spot. The difficulty is where the temple site is, half of that is owned by the Muslims. Yeah. They have a That's the difference. And they have a mosque there. Yeah. That's the difficulty right there. That has to be changed. It won't be difficult. It won't be difficult for God. <laughs> and when they re erect that new temple, just like Solomon's temple, there was no sound of the tools. All this stuff has all been pre-cut, pre-fitted, pre-everything in other sites so that when they get there, it can be put together. And I think that's outstanding. Somebody asked me, why was it so important that there was no sound of a tool in a temple? And I can tell you the answer for that. That's going to be a great temple, but it's still not the most important temple. The most important temple is this body right here. Your own body. That's the most important temple. Huh. Yeah. Was there any tools heard while it was being made? Just think of how different it would be. We had a couple ladies pregnant. You know, Sandra, my daughter-in-law. If you, you know, here they are sitting there and you can hear the hammers and the saws, and <laughs> same saws all going inside of them, you know. <laughs> you sit down next to this lady, boom, 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 boom. When you hit a finger. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many understands why there's no sound? Also, in the incarnation of Christ Jesus, there was no sound. 
Does anybody really know what happened to what? Jesus, when he was incarnated on the, uh, I forget where that was. No. Mount of Olives, wasn't it? I mean, when he was translated. Yeah. Uh, for a moment, they got to see him in his glory that John got to see him in the Isle of Patmos. Um, that, and I'll explain that in this. He had laid aside all of his godly powers, but he didn't cease being God. Right. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. Some off-the-wall millionaire that was responsible for a whole lot of movies and stuff like that. What kind of movies? I know. All kind it's of movies, especially airplane movies. He really was into airplane oh, movies. Oh, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was a billionaire upon billionaire. Right. And he was very eccentric. But lots of times, he would go to a place <clears throat> dressed in a total disguise, sometimes like a bum on the street, because he didn't want people pestering him and bugging him for money and bugging for special privileges and bugging for to be in movies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He just, he wanted to be away from the crowd and alone. And so, so he would be disguised. And, uh, aunt Alice Greedy, you remember mm -hmm. her telling the story? We have a, a great aunt, she was a great aunt, right? Yeah. And uh, it, even when she was old, she was still a waitress at a restaurant because she kept herself looking really good. Am I right, man? Always. Always. And the, Pretty elaborate people would come in there, you know, and uh, she got to meet Frank Sinatra and all those different things. She got to meet Howard Hughes. This guy came in who her boss said, watch this guy. I'm not sure he belongs in this place. <laughs> Nobody knew it was Howard Hughes until he left and paid with a check. And she was impressed because his tip was three times what the bill was. He was generous. Yeah. Generous. Is that pretty cool? Jesus, in that situation, he didn't cease being God. The reason his countenance was changed is because two people that were in heaven, Elijah and Moses, they were meeting with him. So they weren't going to see him as he was now they were going to see him as he was in heaven. Does that make sense to you now? Yeah. They weren't going to see him lower than the angels because he wasn't. They were going to see him as he was in heaven. And the disciples got to glimpse that for a moment. And when Moses and Elijah left, he was back to being the same person. He didn't even have the same physical effects that Moses did back in the Old Testament when he experienced heaven. Because mm -hmm. Moses came down and he'd been in the presence of God and he glowed. Yeah. He glowed. Right. Jesus didn't even have that same effect. Because it was important to also be